Hi, welcome to New Magnetism Part 2. This is Distinti World Video Number 3. Uh, this is the Method of Images for Magnetism. This is the first time I have been publicly released this material. Uh, it is though on file with the Library of Congress. Okay, let's uh, intro to Part 2. In Part 1, the following was discussed. The classical flux model is obsolete. We explored magnetic to magnet to magnet effects. In this presentation, I show you how magnets interact with magnetic materials that are not previously magnetized. And that technique is called the method of images for magnetism. This is the first public release. And in the end, we're going to show you how the iron filing pattern is created. Because I'll show you it's not created because of flux lines. It's created because forces are in balance. So from the previous video, we're going to review the fourth term of new electromagnetism. Okay, like moving currents attract opposite moving currents repel. That's a symbol for attraction, that's a symbol for repulsion. And reviewing also from the previous video, uh, a magnet, a disk magnet, essentially a current ring. If you have two magnets with their current rings going in the same direction here at this point, the currents are going to be going opposite directions, so the magnets will repel. In this direction, because one magnet's upside down, the currents are be going in opposite direct, uh, the same direction there, so they're going to attract. And you can go back to the other video to look at these. These basically are the same thing. But let's look at how, if you had a current ring, another magnet that wasn't quite lined up, okay, and let's say we had, a, we had two, two current rings in these odd uh, orientations here. Well, because the current is going out of the page here, but going into the page here, you're going to have a repulsion between the top of the ring and this part of the ring here. But because this part of the ring is going in the same direction as this, you're going to have a traction. So it's going to try to force that other current ring into this shape here, into this orientation here. And we're going to get to why that's important in a second. Again, if you have one current ring uh, above the other current ring, it's going to, uh, if you go through all that force again, you're going to find the above current ring is going to want to try to turn so it orients so you get maximum attraction. So, oh, I forgot to tell you in the previous video, um, the edge currents of a magnet range from 1,000 amps for standard magnets to about 3,500 amps or more for neodymium magnets. Uh, we'll have another video later to show how to measure and determine these. There's a simple little Arduino. There's a simple sensor you can get for a couple bucks. It's pretty accurate. You hook it up to an Arduino and you can get, and I'll, sh and with a, I'll give you a spreadsheet that you can calculate the uh, the current in the ring later. I'll give that away for free so you guys can play because playing is half the fun of this stuff. Okay, but how do magnets attract the steel ball? Let's start do the steel balls first. Remember, the balls are not magnetized, so they don't have an edge current. So how are non-magnetized objects attracted to magnets without the edge current? The following discussion uh, will develop how the new magnetism model of images causes an edge current to occur uh, and again, this is the first public release of this material. So let's suppose we have this. This is a magnet because all of the little atoms are all aligned, so all of their current rings are in the same direction. So you have the current going into the page on this edge of the magnet, and going into the page is shown by an arrow, and coming out of the page is shown by an arrow head. That's typical electromagnetic. Uh, uh, so that we have a, a current ring. We have a disk magnet here. And down here, we have a sheet of unmagnetized steel. And you can see all the current rings in the steel are all on different, these are all the little, uh, the atoms of iron that have their, their, that electron orbit. They're all in different directions, so there's no coherent uh, magnetic field being performed, uh, uh, created. Now, if you bring these closer together, if you remember the previous uh, slides where I showed you these, the magnetic field is going to force these guys to align. And once they force so it's going to try to rotate them so that they, they will have maximum alignment. And because of that, we're going to essentially magnetize. Now, if you bring the magnet far away, these, most of these are going to go back to where they were. Okay, but if you're, if you're strong enough, you leave, some of these will stick. That's how you magnetize something. And so what's going to happen, because you're forcing these to align properly, you're, force, you're causing them to start attracting to each other. And that's why a magnet will stick to iron or steel or whatnot. Okay, but oh, this is kind of complicated to model using standard techniques. So, but the beauty is, is that Mother Nature loves simplicity. 
and I'm going to show, and that's my effigy, that's my logo, it's an effigy of Mother Nature. So what I developed is a new magnetism model of images. If Let's say this is a steel plate and you have a magnet a certain distance uh, above the steel plate. And this eyeball means you're observing from this side. If you had a sensor and you could observe from this side, you would see an image of the magnet as if it were a mirror that would be equal and opposite distance behind. And I'm, gonna, I'm developing a sensor which will allow you to see that image. Uh, another Arduino project, a little more complicated than the one I just explained will allow you to look at the images in the steel. You can see the image of the magnet as a reflected image um, using an interesting sensor that I found. Okay, but now this, because the steel isn't perfect, the image is oh, down here is only going to be about maybe 90 to 80 to 90 percent of this image, and there's a lot of other factors that um, affect that, like the material, the thickness of the material, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, even the width of the material affects that. Um, so, let's assume the sheet is very th uh, wide. Now, this is paramagnetic materials. Paramagnetic materials, you get a positive image. And a paramagnetic material is iron, which is really a ferromagnetic material, which is a paramagnetic material with a hysteresis curve. Okay, in other words, a ferromagnetic material can stick and retain its magnetism, where a paramag just straight paramagnetic material, once a magnetic field is removed, it goes back to its normal state. Uh, a diamagnetic material, which is like a superconductor, the image you get here is negative. Okay, uh, we're not going to go into diamagnetic materials, but essentially, if a paramagnetic material causes the magnet to stick, then the diamagnetic material would cause the the uh, the image, the negative image, would repel the uh, magnet. Now, this technique is only for low frequency, low velocity modeling. It needs a lot more work if it's going to be used for higher frequency stuff. Be the reason why is because the rate at which you can realign the little orbits in the steel depends a lot on how fast you're trying to do it and the structure of the steel, whether it's got contaminants, yada, yada, yada. I'm not going to get into all that. Okay, but essentially, from the observer side, you see a positive 80% reflection. This is similar, for example, when you look into a mirror. Now, the, the thing that people don't realize is this is, uh, this is actually a reflection of light waves, so, but it's the same idea. Photo by Paul Reynolds. But now let's suppose you were able to observe what you see from the back side of the steel. The back side would see a negative 80% image, and it will be at about the same place. I showed it off a little bit so you could see it, but it's going to be at the same place that the magnet is. And so from the other side, you're only going to see 100% minus 80 percent, you're going to see an image that's only 20 percent. Oops, 20 percent, not 20 dollars. Okay, so that negative image is going to cancel the image, and so you're only going to see 20 percent of the magnet. That's basically there. And that's basically how shielding works. And, and I, when we get into deeper into ethereal mechanics and stuff, I'm going to show you that there's no such thing as shielding because there's no material to shield anything. I mean, it, this cannonball over here, the amount of actual material in this cannonball wouldn't even fit on the tip of a, of a pin. And so there's really nothing here blocking uh, electromagnetic waves from going through. The only way electromagnetic waves are blocked is because the electromagnetic waves hit the electrons and they create an equal and opposite reflection which cancels the waves going through, but we'll get into that in more detail. And this is how magnetic materials shield, quote unquote, shield magnetic fields. They don't shield it, they just create an inverse image which cancels some of it. And of course, the thicker this steel is, the more is going to be canceled and the less you're going to see on the other side. Hi, this is the demonstration to show you how the negative image appears. If you'll notice, we have a, a magnetic sensor here which is coupled to a, a DVM and it's showing uh, 90, or about 1 volt, oh, I'm sorry, 99 millivolt, 100 millivolts. And that works out to a certain amount of flux. I, I don't remember if the conversion is offhand. But let's say that's 100 percent. That's why I, I chose that. What I'm going to do now is this is a flat bar magnet. There's the sensor. And this is a uh, distance was chosen so that it becomes exactly, it stays halfway in the middle of the old army ammo can. I'm going to put that on there. And you can see that we lose 
almost 90 percent. So the negative image here is 90 percent because this is a good quality steel ammo can. Now there's a lot of other factors involved. This is, you know, there's like the distance between the wall and all that stuff matters. The saturation of the steel matters. There's a lot of other factors. This is, um, but this is a way to model it and it would take somebody a, probably a good amount of work to come out with all the factors that make the model a lot more useful than I'm showing it here. Anyway, thank you. Now this is a simple overview. The more precise application will account for the thickness, type of material, magnetic saturation, characteristics, and frequency, etc., etc., etc. Let's look at other shapes. Okay, let's say we have a disc magnet and we put a steel ball next to it. Well, just like the method of images for a plate, you're going to see a reflection in the steel ball of the current. Just like here's a cannonball and I don't know if you can see the reflection. Let me do it this way. Okay, assume this LED light is a, a current edge of a magnet and you can probably see the reflection of that current in the cannonball. And that's pretty much what happens to a steel ball. If you could image the induced current in the steel ball you would see pretty much a reflection of the current from the magnet because it, again the magnetic field is inducing a like current in the face of the steel ball. And of course this image will appear, if this, this is distance d, this image will appear back here by instance. I shouldn't have drawn it on the outside image back just like the light did. If you go back and replay that you'll see the light image look farther behind than the surface of the ball. Okay and now what happens though is the return current because it's being repelled by the edge current isn't it's likely it's probably going to go some of the way back but some of it's going to go through the middle and so the, the return current isn't going to be a nice straight ring like you have for a magnet. It's going to be diffused. Okay so let me show you the ball from the top. Here's the ball. You're going to have the image of the current but the return currents are going to be diffused throughout the ball. So the magnetic effect on the back side isn't going to be as strong but you could attach another ball to it. In other words, you can have a strong enough magnet where you could have balls stacked up on balls. That's what I call fraying. Now when you have the ball on top of the disc, okay, because you're inducing a current in the ball and it's frayed, so don't it's not a complete ring, but you get attraction. That's why the ball doesn't go over the edge to the current. It's got the side because you've got you're pulling it and it, that's why it's, it wants to be at the edge, but it doesn't go over the edge at the current. It stays right on the surface. But now, what about the blade? Let me show you the experiment with the blade. Okay, here's our MagnaView film over one of the disc magnets that has multiple edge currents running through it. Uh, what we showed before is that the disc, the washer, wanted to go between the edge currents. And let me show you that that works also with a uh, scraper blade. Put the scraper blade down. It's going to want to go between the edge currents and it'll actually stand up but it's right between the edge currents. Probably can't see it on the other side. Let me turn this around so the light gets it just right. I hope you can see that. I can't see what the camera's looking at. So that's the edge current demonstration. Coming back from that experiment. So the question is now why does the blade want to go in between the current? of the magnet. Why does it want to go on one of the currents of the magnet? Well, the way we explain that, and I'm only showing half of this is the trying to put the blade on one of the surface currents shown by the red, where the red is one direction of current and the black the opposite direction of current. So what happens is this current over here, okay, is able creates an image of itself which appears back here so you have an attraction okay but because of this guy over here or well because there's a, also it creates a negative image of itself which is really on top of this but I'm showing it up here for um, simplicity that causes a repulsion from this guy okay and again you're gonna have that's only showing half now you have to do the same thing with this guy so you just end up getting virtually nothing I'm only showing half this guy is going to create its own negative image which is going to repel this guy, and this guy's going to create its own um, positive image out here, which is going to attract it, but you're still going to have equal number 
of green and red arrows which is virtually no attraction and your distances are going to be twice as far as this where if the blade is in the middle okay this guy is going to create a positive image of itself on the back side which is going to be attractive and it's going to create a negative image on this side which is going to be repulsive of this guy oh I'm sorry attractive to this guy because of the same and so you're going to get double attraction here plus it's half the distance so it's going to be four times the force so this is the strongest point of attraction for the blade and that's why the blade wants to go between the current rings or the edge currents rather okay now going back to you know why we see this field pattern okay if you were to take a little disk magnet and you're able to roll it around a big disk magnet where the normals of that disk magnet current go would trace out what you would see uh, with the current rings. But here's the, here's the rub. These are going to be under heavy attraction. They're going to fall in in all directions. They're going to fall in. Whereas the magnetic field lines, they don't fall in. So, what, so there's got to be something, the forces have to be in balance for these iron filings to stay where they are instead of what a little test magnet would do is be attracted right edge to edge in. So what holds the iron filings in place? Yeah, and these are the things that have kept me awake at night. Well, if you look at iron filings, okay, here's a bar magnet. And you get this big edge current here. It induces all the magnets to have the opposite induced current in the iron filings. Okay, because of that, these guys, because of the shorter distance, these guys are repulsive of each other because they're in the same direction. This is repulsive of itself. But because this attracts to this, and this attracts to this, and this attracts to this, and this attracts to that, you have, it's like a string that's being pushed out by this repulsive force. And so you've got the repulsive forces, and the string's trying to pull everything back, holding everything in stasis with a little bit of friction from the paper. And that's why you get this pattern. It's not a magnetic field. It is a very complicated interaction between magnetic fields of induced in the iron filings along with... It. So it's, it's a lot of things going on. It's not the field. It's not a magnetic field. Okay, again, you've got repulsion between these lines of but you've got attractions because they're attracted end to end because of the orientation of the current rings induced into the iron filings. So you get attraction as if they're a string, but you've got repulsion because these guys all repel against each other because they're in repulsion here. And I should use red ink for that, but I don't have it. And that's why you get this pattern that is static. It's not a magnetic field. It's just the way iron filings behave in a magnetic field. And this is why we have rule of acquisition number 10, which says do not derive a theory from observations. Okay, whatever, because the reason why is because, you know, the model that they came up for the iron filings did not behave the way the balls behaved. And it didn't follow the way that the blade or the disc of steel behaved. Okay, and it doesn't follow the behavior of a disc magnet in this field either. So whatever, but whatever theory you do come up with has to explain all those different outcomes. And that's the difference. We do, should not make, uh, we do not derive theory from observations, but complementarily, theories or models must mimic what we observed, not be derived from what we observe. Okay, because the cause may not look like the effect. And you can read the rest of this on your own. Uh, in, in next video, we're going to show the simple visualizations for the other terms of new electromagnetism. Thank you. Uh, Please donate if you can. Definitely subscribe and get the word out about these videos. You're helping me a lot. Thank you. Bye.